Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking your time to join us today for this exciting webinar being brought to you by Syntica. My name is Gabriel Escalante, and I will be your host for today's session. Our webinar today is titled Bench to, Bench to Bedside Series, Preclinical Cancer Research with Syntica. Today's web webinar will be given by do both Drs. Katie Parkins and Tyler Lalonde, both whom are product managers within the imaging division at Syntica. Allow me to provide you some background information about our presenters. Katie holds a PhD from the University of Western Ontario in medical biophysics. Throughout her research training, she was focused on development and application of novel molecular imaging tools to monitor and treat disease, specifically cancer. Additionally, Katie completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, where she used multimodal imaging to investigate the molecular mechanism that may determine immunotherapy response. In her present role as preclinical imaging specialist at Syntica, Katie supports our customers in understanding the products offered and how these instruments help to meet their research needs. Tyler has an interdisciplinary background in biochemistry, chemistry, radiochemistry, molecular imaging, and chemical biology. He specialized in surface chemistry during his undergraduate studies in biochemistry. At Laurentian University, he studied biodegradable implant materials using various microscopy techniques. He then moved on to the University of Western Ontario where he developed novel, novel imaging pharmaceuticals for various human diseases, such as cancer and cardiovascular disease. From here, he expanded his scope in drug design and development at Texas A&M University as a postdoctoral fellow. Tyler has been in the field of research and development for 11 years now and has knowledge in multiple areas. So we, before we begin, I would like to briefly mention a few housekeeping rules. We anticipate that today's webinar will take up the full hour, so we might not have time to answer your questions at the end. However, please submit your questions to the Q&A dialogue box throughout the presentation. We will then create a transcript of the questions we do answer during the sessions, during the session, pardon me, as well as those that we may not have a chance to address. We will distribute this document within the next few days. And I also, uh, please also know that we're recording today's session. So if for some reason you lose the connection or can't hear everything clearly, you will have access to the video file to review later. Without further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Katie. Thanks, Gabriel, for the introduction and welcome to everyone joining us for today's webinar. To start the discussion today, we're gonna to go through a brief introduction to cancer research. We'll talk about what we mean when we say bench to bedside and how this idea has really evolved over the years. We'll then jump into some of the instrumentation that's used in cancer research, starting with tools for in vitro characterization, technologies that are ideal for rapid throughput and ex experiments and more quantitative uh, measurements. And then we'll end by tying in some of our translational technologies that can be used to create a more clinically relevant disease model. Okay, so what is cancer? Cancer refers to the uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. So cancer develops when the body's normal control mechanisms stop working. Old cells don't die and instead grow out of control, forming new abnormal cells. And these extra cells may form a massive tissue called a tumor. Now, additionally, and importantly, cancer can often spread into or invade nearby tissues and can travel to distant places in the body to form new tumors. And this is a process called metastasis uh, and is the cause of most cancer-related deaths. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the world, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths in 2020. However, survival rates are improving for many types of cancer. And this is thanks to improvements in cancer screening, treatment, and prevention, which is large, largely a result of cancer efforts um, in research in the last couple of decades. Cancer research is a careful step-by-step uh, -step process. So researchers across the globe study every stage of the cancer journey from prevention and screening to diagnosis, treatment, uh, life after cancer and end of life care. What we know about cancer, how to prevent it, how it develops, how to treat it and how to cope, help people cope with it uh, really depends on different kinds of research. And this research happens at many levels in many different diverse settings. The term bench to bedside is used to describe uh, the process by which the results of research done in the lab are directly used to develop new ways to treat patients. 
And while this term is not new by any means, the concept has definitely evolved quite a bit since it was first used uh, back in 1968 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so it was previously thought that the journey from bench to bedside was fairly unidirectional. So we'd start with discovery research or basic research, uh, moving towards preclinical studies, and the successful few ending with clinical trials. However, in the last decade, it's become apparent that impactful uh, translational research really requires skills and resources that are not always readily available in a basic lab or an exclusively clinical setting. And so it's really become crucial for clinicians and basic scientists to be collaborating from the very beginning, uh, whether it's as discoveries move from bench to bedside or even moving back from the bedside to the bench. So why is this important? Well, if we look at the funnel here, uh, representing sort of the standard workflow of bench to bedside, we know there may be billions of potential drug candidates. Many will appear promising in both their design, uh, maybe targeted approach, and we'll move on to in vitro studies. From here, it's important to characterize the drug or particle or cell uh, to better understand its potential as a therapeutic. So investigating things like efficacy, potency, uh, toxicity, and really narrowing it down to a more limited list of candidates to assess in vivo. And then based on our findings from animal studies, very few will actually check all of the boxes necessary to move on to clinical trials. And even with all of this screening, which typically takes years and years of research, many of the candidates that make it to the clinical phase will not show to have the same effects in patients as was seen in preclinical studies. And so if we look at this example, this chart was published back in 2018, and focus in on oncology studies only at the top, of the 57% of studies that successfully make it from phase one to two during clinical trials, only about 3.4% of those will end up getting approved. And so the, it's important to note here that as scientists, we really need to look for more efficient and translational tools to help us get from the development phase to the clinic faster and more reliably. How do we do this? Well, we need to carefully plan out each study that we do. So first, define clear research objectives, search the literature and understand the roadmap that already exists. What are the gaps and how can we fill them with our research questions? Outline experiments and hypotheses clearly, set reasonable timelines and milestones. And this is, this is something that's even and starting to be enforced by the funding agencies themselves. And most importantly, look for answers in the data and not in your hypotheses or past literature. This is really important, I think, um, as scientists, especially with limited funding, it's easy to get comfortable with you know, the questions we may already think we know the answers to, um, play it safe as you rather, but it's important to note that some of the best science comes from um, you know, the answers we weren't necessarily looking for. So always try and focus on um, tuning into the data itself and not necessarily uh, what you had predicted. First, researchers uh, work to understand how healthy cells grow, and then they look for differences in cancer cells. This type of research, which is often called basic or discovery research, aims to understand how cancer starts, grows, and spreads. And this knowledge is really an essential starting point for developing future tests and treatment. By studying individual cells or tissues rather than whole organisms, researchers can gain more control over their studies and can test many different factors at a time. They can turn specific genes off or on uh, or expose cells to a certain substance, condition, or possible treatment and measure the effects. And in general, these type of studies are great for high throughput work and are relatively inexpensive and easy to implement compared to in vivo studies. And so typically this is where people will start. For those in the early stages of study planning, there are many online resources available to help you choose a cell line. If you wanna model a certain type of cancer, uh, maybe you don't already have available in your lab, you can consider asking a collaborator to share a cell line or consider purchasing a previously developed cell line from a supplier. And so this is just one example here, um, but there are many, especially for cancer cell lines. And so if you're feeling a little lost in where to start, 
feel free to reach out uh, with what you're looking for. And Tyler or myself will be happy to sort of guide you in the right direction of where these can be found. Regardless of the type of cancer you're studying, it's always ideal to try and start with an immortalized cell line as they're easy to culture. They're typically well characterized in terms of their behavior and growth patterns. This is something that may actually be available to you if you purchase a cell line. However, it's always a good idea to repeat some of those characterization studies uh, once the cells are, are, are in your own lab. And then of course, because they are immortalized, they're ideal for any high throughput work. In terms of instrumentation that can really add to your characterization studies, I wanted to highlight a fairly new group of technologies uh, here known as live cell imaging systems. And these can contribute to both the quality and the throughput of your in vitro studies. So we all know cells need to be monitored in order to study the fundamentals of cell growth dynamics. Traditionally, scientists have been fairly comfortable with removing their cells from culture, uh, putting them on a microscope to acquire an image or take some measurements, and then returning them uh, to those physiological conditions. However, we now know that can be um, really crucial and in terms of getting accurate measurements can really prevent you um, because you're taking them out of those relevant uh, environmental conditions. And so live cell monitoring has really emerged in the last couple of years. It can be done with compact uh, microscopes that fit right within your incubator. So you can actually leave your cells in the proper environment while acquiring all of your data. And this can be done for both bright field uh, imaging as well as fluorescent imaging for those of you that are using uh, reporter genes. In terms of application, of course, this is uh, used for sort of any routine, routine cell culture process, um, such as tracking cell confluency, uh, proliferation, or you know, survival curves. So here are a few examples of the live cell imaging systems that we offer at Syntica. These are manufactured by Cytosmart. The smallest is the Lux2 here on the left. It's capable of bright field imaging only. Uh, and it is, I promise you, quite small. You could probably fit three or four on one shelf of your incubator. Um, a little bit bigger, but still compact enough to fit uh, multiple in one incubator is the Lux3 FL, and it has bright field and fluorescence imaging capabilities. Both of these systems have a single field of view, um, but you can it can provide time-lapse movies of yourselves over a period of hours or days. And then finally, the largest and most high throughput system is the Omni, and it's capable of scanning an entire flask or well plate. So if you have a, let's say a 96 um, well plate with 96 different conditions, and you want to assess growth over a four day period, you can set it up so that it runs over the four days, scanning and collecting data for each individual well or condition, uh, all while remaining in your incubator under the relevant physiological conditions. So that's, that's a very high throughput system. Uh, lots of data that you're able to acquire uh, remotely. In terms of the applications relevant to oncology, um, of course, many are using this just for basic proliferation rate studies, um, but it can also be really useful for assessing things like transfection and transduction efficiency. So if you are engineering your cells, um, typically you're going to uh, maybe a fax sorting facility um, which can be uh, quite expensive um, and also risk sort of contaminating those cells depending on the cell population you're using. Um, and so this is a really nice way to do that non-invasively and get an idea of um, how successful your transduction uh, was. Many are also using it for co-culture experiments. So looking at the interaction between cancer cells and immune cells, for example, this can be done by uh, labeling just one cell type only or using different uh, labels for each cell. So for example, cancer cells that express GFP uh, and an immune cell type uh, that expresses RFP so that you're able to see them in the same image. And then of course, this is a really nice way to look at the effect of drugs on cells. So coming up with a survival curve uh, over time. Now, after finding an innovative idea that shows promise in cells, researchers need to take their studies to the next level by employing animal models that have similar biology to humans and perform in vivo studies. The advantages here are that you can evaluate the entire subject, you get dynamic information since you can use tools to acquire measurements in the same subject over time rather than just a snapshot. 
And for the most part, these assays are non-invasive, leaving the underlying biology intact so that one can track changes in the entire disease process. One of the most commonly used in vivo tools in cancer research is optical imaging. This can be attributed to the fact that it's very easy to adapt. So whether you're a lab with or without any imaging experience, it's very simple and inexpensive to operate and can be used for a wide variety of preclinical cancer applications. Most systems on the market offer either bioluminescence, fluorescence, or both. And some of the newer technologies have additional 3D tomography capabilities. So this would allow the user to reconstruct the signal within the animal body. One of the most important advantages of this technology is that it's a whole body imaging modality. So this is especially helpful in cancer studies where you don't always know where to expect tumors, such as in the case of spontaneous metastasis. And so optical can be a really great first step in understanding your cancer model um, before going into uh, using some of the technologies that Tyler will talk about a little bit later. In terms of applications, optical is used in two sort of main ways, uh, or sort of main types of studies. Firstly is to track the cancer itself. So monitoring the spread over time or response to treatment. And secondly would be to, to monitor a therapeutic. So instead of having a tumor that expresses a reporter gene, you could tag your drug or therapeutic cell and track its survival or migration over time relative to the disease state. And of course, many will get creative and use the system for both. So for example, engineering your cancer cell line with luciferase so that it can be imaged with bioluminescence and then engineering a thera therapeutic cell such as CAR T cells with uh, let's say TD tomato so that they can be tracked with fluorescence imaging in the same animal. That was a lot of information to get us started. Uh, so with that, we're gonna take a quick break. I'm gonna pass things back to Gabe for a full question. Uh, thank you, Katie, for the great discussion so far. Uh, like Katie mentioned, we're going to take a small uh, small break. I would like to ask a couple of quick poll questions. So let me just get them out. So the first questions are, are you in clinical, preclinical, or both areas of research? And you can select uh, one of them. And the second one is, what are the current technologies you implement within your research? You can select all the, all the ones that apply. So we're gonna wait a few moments for everyone to answer the questions. Just gonna wait a little bit more and we're gonna continue in a second. Okay, thank you everyone for answering. I am now going to uh, hand over the presentation to Tyler. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, so that was a great introduction by Katie uh, and hopefully now I'll be able to kind of go through some uh, in vivo tools for this bench to bedside process. You'll notice here on the side of the slide, kind of the scale bar as we approach the bedside we're getting into, into instrumentation that gets a little more relevant to what we could potentially see in the clinic. Um, so you'll see this slide bar slowly move as we go throughout this presentation. So the first technology I'll talk about uh, that's really, really nice for microscopic scale imaging and analysis is intravital microscopy. Uh, so it's an all-in-one confocal two-photon microscope uh, and it's designed for live animal uh, imaging, uh, you looking at cancer xenografts, uh, T cell infiltration that we see here, monitoring circulating tumor cells, uh, the drug delivery methods uh, through nanoparticles uh, are some of the images that we see. And these are molecular and functional information at a 3D level that we're able to obtain. So each of these examples, I'm gonna provide one that's related to cancer research. 
Um, so here we have a longitudinal cancer xenograph imaging study. It's a non small cell lung carcinoma. Uh, the cancer cells are labeled with GFP. It is a subcutaneous tumor model. And here we're trying to look at the progression and regression of the tumor over time in response to treatment. And we can see that the vessels are labeled with a tamridextrin dye. And the vasculature is very disorganized uh, in this tumor model. But if we start to do longitudinal imaging of this animal, we can see that there's a major difference between the treated versus non-treated cases. And we're using anti-antiogenic treatment and the vasculature is becoming more organized and normalized over time with this treatment. This allows drug therapies to reach the tumor much more efficiently. We can turn on or off channels to look at just the vasculature versus the tissue. And we can see that here where we're monitoring this treatment effect in vessel morphology and looking at the increased dilation. Again, that increased dilation is allowing uh, chemotherapeutics to breach the tumor site as a more effective therapeutic option. This type of system can also look at immune cell infiltration in various tissues and organs. Uh, we see this here in the lymph node where we're looking at the infiltration of T and B cells. But we can also see this in an inflammatory response in the skin uh, where CARS was injected and it's known to cause inflammation in cancer cells. And we can watch that inflammatory response happen uh, in live imaging. Another tool that becomes highly useful as we start to approach um, the more clinical stage, we're still in the preclinical here, but this is high frequency ultrasound. High frequency ultrasound uh, in the oncology world is used for tumor detection, 3D volume measurements. Uh, we can look at the surrounding tissue as well and see how the surrounding tissue is changing over time due to tumors uh, in the area. And also monitor blood flow uh, and tumor vascularization as we've kind of seen in the previous uh, intervital microscopy. Types of tumor models that we can investigate with ultrasound. Uh, and these are the common tumor models that we see in preclinical research, uh, cell-derived models, uh, PDX models or patient-derived xenograph models, environmentally induced uh, tumor models, as well as genetically engineered uh, animal models. So these types of solid tumors can, are commonly used in preclinical research, and we can use these tools to investigate them. So here we see the high frequency ultrasound system by a sharp, and we can clearly see a subcutaneous tumor model that's visible here. We can also look into transgenic liver tumor models that we see right here. And the ultrasound program allows you to model the tumor and calculate a volume for that tumor. We can compare orthotopic versus IP injected tumors where we see an orthotopic mammary fat pad tumor using uh, MDA, MB231 cells versus an IP injected SCOV3 cells where we're going to see multiple tumor sites uh, in various tissues. So high frequency ultrasound also has the ability to look at more complex tumor models and follow the tissue and identify whether tissue that's surrounding the tumor is normal or abnormal. And we can watch those changes in real time and follow it longitudinally. Another very useful system when it comes to preclinical research is positron emission tomography and computed tomography. So, what do we develop PET tracers for and why do we develop PET tracers? We develop them for several reasons. To look at things such as cell proliferation, apoptosis, angiogenesis, metastases, gene expression, receptor ligand interactions, substrate transportation, metabolism, 
of nutrients. So there's many ways we can develop pet tracers and there's many different styles of pet tracers, whether that's small molecule, peptide, antibody based, or even uh, nanoparticle based. And they are also able to follow different tumor models, whether that's orthotopic, transgenic xenograft or metastatic tumors. Why would you wanna use PET? Well, it does have a very high sensitivity and this is mostly because of targeted PET agents that are used within this modality. So they're very targeted towards a ligand that's overexpressed in a particular cancer. They do show a high spatial resolution of less than or equal to than one millimeter. And it's also quantifiable. And we can monitor that through metabolism, such as the gold standard that we see in PET imaging, uh, FDG, that's labeled with fluoride 18. And we'll see that in the upcoming images. So this system, the Super Argus PET CT system, uh, is a really, really nice system and provides very clear and precise images to look at tumors. And here we see a male rat with a subcutaneous tumor on the hind limb. The dosage was around 40 megabecrels and acquisition time was less than one hour. And we used CT to provide some anatomical context to where that pet, single, pet signal was located uh, within this rat. And we can clearly see the tumor within the hind limb. This is 3D reconstructed images uh, through the system's software, and it allows to visualize uh, the rat in a 3D fashion. Let's see, there we go. We can also use PET to look at the heterogeneity of a tumor and look and at different regions within the tumor to identify regions that might be the necrotic core. And we can see that within the tumor here. So this was a nude mouse, uh, pancreatic subcutaneous tumor. The dosage was around 20 megabecrels. Again, it was FDG. And incubation period, again, was less than one hour. And we can see the uptake differences within this tumor. And we see a lack of signal where that necrotic core is. We can then identify regions of this tumor that are maybe have greater blood flow uh, or greater metabolism of the tracer. This is a example by Martin Pomper and his group uh, that was published uh, in Science Advances and in 2019. And this was, they transduced anti-CD19 CAR T cells with PSMA and monitored it with PET. So they used a F18 uh, DSF PYL tracer, which is specific for prostate membrane specific antigen. And they used this tracer along with the CAR T cells to monitor CAR T cell disposition clinically. They provided a standard curve to actually calculate the number of CAR T cells that were being injected. And we can see it in the images, but we can also see it here in the standard curve. So this was using both the CAR T cells, but a PET tracer to monitor uh, and visualize CAR T cell therapy uh, with positron emission tomography. Another example uh, we see here is a peptide-based PET that was to quantify PDL1 therapeutics. So immune point check therapies have shown tremendous promise within cancer research and cancer therapy. However, uh, their target engagement is harder to assess and to predict the efficacy has been lacking. But using PET tracers, we can show this efficacy over time. So this was a um, PDL1 targeted peptide labeled with copper 64, and they were monitoring antibody treatment over time using uh, this peptide-based probe for PDL1 one and uh, a copper 64 labeled peptide. And they can see biodistribution and monitor the treatment with increasing dose of antibody over time. 
for PDL1 therapeutics. And so this was uh, a way to monitor treatment using PET. Now we're going to kind of flip the page a little to a different imaging modality, uh, magnetic resonant imaging, and more specifically preclinical MRI. So MRI is used in multiple fields to identify anatomy, morphology, neurology, cancer biology, cardiovascular biology, multimodal imaging, which I'll show in the later slides, but as well as ex vivo imaging. This can be done with contrast or no contrast agents. And with this particular MR, uh, one Tesla system with contrast agents, the resolution is quite significant. A classical preclinical MRI example in terms of uh, cancer research is looking at uh, tumor spread within the brain. And here we see four days post injection and 15 days post injection here. And we can see the tumor is quite visible and it's spread throughout the brain and it's enlarged within the ventricles. But we can also use MRI to quantify the size of these tumors and actually get a tumor volume measurement. If we can obtain a tumor volume measurement with MRI, we can also follow treatment over time and the therapeutic effect of a particular drug. So in the top panel here, uh, we have a control and we have a treated um, animal down here. And we can clearly see there's a decrease in the tumor size with the treated animal over time within a couple weeks period. And we can measure that tumor volume as I specified earlier using dedicated software uh, that's available with this MR system. So in cancer biology, again, another good example is to show a interperitoneal injected ovarian tumor cells and look at the various tumors forming within the animal and label those tumors uh, with a color coding. So these are SCOV3 cell line that was injected IP. And this was a four and a half minute acquisition time to look at these tumors within the mouse and actually quantify their volume. Along with MR, we can do simultaneous PET MR imaging. Why is this a benefit? Well, the MR gives that more um, imaging-based approach where we can visualize the tumors, but the PET gives further detail in terms of metabolism that I explained before and what's happening with that tumor over time. So here we can look at simultaneous PET MR in an example where we have a necrotic core within a tumor. And we have a void where there, the PET tracer is not identified in that necrotic core. We can also identify that necrotic core in the MR image and overlay to be confident that that tumor has heterogeneity within it and we can measure the tumor volume as well. So the simultaneous PET imaging allows you to provide extra context to what's happening with the vasculature of the tumor, as well as tumor progression over time and how it's changing. And a CT image can also be overlaid to provide additional anatomical context. So to kind of put it in a little more perspective, the complementary nature of these imaging modalities is very, very useful. And it's a way for us to compare tumor volumes and tumor progression over time, where Katie showed this optical imaging using um, the Vilber system, moving into ultrasound and then moving into MR. And in the case of ultrasound and MR, it's highly accurate in measuring that tumor volume and matches well with the optical. Then we need to transition more into that clinical stage. And the reason being, the more we can be precise within the preclinical, the in vivo, and then coming into the clinical stage, the more success we can have of drugs not failing within the phases of clinical trials, so phase one through four. 
And we've kind of really touched on the different instrumentation that can be used to incre increase that success rate. And one way to do this is using next generation bioprinting. So 4D bioprinting or tissue engineering. So we see the robotic arm here within this bioprinter uh, by Poitus that's able to fully automate and print tissue. And it can print from cells to spheroids using a large number of different biomaterials or hydrogels. This really allows to bridge the translational gap from animal to human. And bioprinted autologous tissues are personalized for cancer therapies. 4D bioprinting uh, is a, here's a classical tissue example where we have a stratified epidermis, 40 centimeters squared and almost 700 microns thick within 21 days of bioprinting that tissue. Why is this useful in cancer? Well, bioprinting was evolved to overcome the lim limitations that we see within 2D cell culture and to create functional tissues, organoids, tumors, and organon chip models. It provides a more clinically relevant 3D, 3D cancer models for chemotherapeutic screening. And we see that in this example here, published in ACS Biomaterial Science and Engineering, where adipose-derived mesenchymal stromal cells uh, which are one of the major stromal cells in breast cancer microenvironment, were 3D printed with a um, combination of primary breast cancer cells. And they investigated treatment with doxorubicin and doxorubicin resistance over time. And they did so by looking at caspase 3. And what they found is that the percentage of caspase 3 was significantly lower in the bioprinted cells compared to the cancer cell constructs alone. And had this been more available prior to pushing certain drugs into the clinic, we would understand why failures are happening and why drug resistance is happening at the clinical stage. So if we can investigate this early on with our drugs prior to going into the phases, we would see a greater success rate within phases one through four and ultimately providing an FDA approved clinical drug. I will now pass it over to Katie to talk a little more about some other useful preclinical and clinical instrumentation. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, so as we near the end of today's webinar, I just wanted to quickly touch on one more way that cancer researchers can make their work more translational. And that's with the use of hypoxia chambers or workstations. And so whether you want to start small, um, there's options like something on the left where you can actually implement them right into your existing um, incubator to try and um, have more control over the environment of your cell culture. Um, or you can start to move to something closer to the one on the right. So a larger workstation where your entire experimental workflow is done within those physiological conditions. And these systems are really designed to mimic the physiology of your subject matter. And so the, this can give you the reassurance of precise results under those controlled conditions. And so you can start to um, maintain things like CO2, oxygen, uh, humidity, and, and temperature. And so if we go to the next slide, we can start to think about ways that this can be used um, in oncology. So the most obvious one is just to basically grow and maintain cancer cell populations or uh, therapeutic cell populations related to oncology within the relevant environment. Um, but secondly, you could test therapeutics. So for example, T cells have shown to behave differently in hypoxic conditions. So this is something that would be important to sort of control for in vitro prior to getting to those in vivo studies. And then finally, uh, many groups are starting to use hypoxia inducible systems. So for example, um, gene expression that's driven by hypoxia. So if we look at the example on the right, this is one way we can tie imaging back into this. We have a hypoxia response element or HRE uh, promoting uh, luciferase. So that means that the luciferase gene is only gonna get turned on under hypoxic conditions. And then we're able to image it using uh, bioluminescence imaging. 
So just to finish up, I wanted to show just sort of one example of how these different tools can be used together, um, because we did touch on a lot of different technologies today. The possibilities really are endless. So this is just one, uh, one example um, that includes sort of many of those different modalities we discussed. Um, so for example, if we have an immune cell population, let's say natural killer cells or NK cells, we can maintain them under hypoxic conditions and then characterize them in vitro using uh, one of our hypoxia chambers or hypoxia workstations. You could then move on to maybe a live imaging system that we mentioned earlier for your characterization studies. So something like a co-culture experiment where you have cancer cells that express uh, RFP and your natural killer cells express GFP. So you're able to sort of monitor their interaction over time. Once you're uh, happy with your cells and you've characterized them properly in vitro, you can maybe generate an animal model um, and use something like the optical system for your screening. So um, we all know tumor models don't always take or have a 100% success rate. So optical is a really great high throughput system where you're able to image multiple animals at once and you can kind of use imaging to guide you um, on which uh, cohorts, I guess, or animals are having success uh, to push forward into your other uh, studies. You could use uh, the optical system to monitor both the tumor as well as the therapeutic cell. And I mentioned this earlier. So for example, you could uh, monitor tumor burden using RFP imaging or uh, bioluminescence. And then you could track the NK cells uh, relative to the tumor burden using something like GFP. If you wanted something that was more quantitative, uh, like the technologies that Tyler mentioned, uh, you could consider the SIMPAT MR systems where you could get uh, a fairly precise tumor volume measurement using MRI and maybe something like tumor metabolism uh, with PET. Then we also need to consider you know, making this more translationally relevant. So let's say you go through this entire pipeline, your results look really great. Um, I would consider you know, adding in something like our bioprinter. So maybe you want to, the bioprinter is capable of printing tissues with fluorescent cells. So maybe you wanna repeat this whole uh, experimental workflow, but you wanna print your tissues with the bioprinter just to make that animal model even just a little bit more clinically relevant um, and see if the results are reproducible. Okay, so in summary, I know that was a lot of information. Um, cancer research is multidisciplinary, requires many different areas of expertise to come together and to answer these important questions about things like underlying mechanisms, treatment response, causes of recurrence. Um, there's many considerations that need to be made when planning your studies, things like infrastructure, uh, resources, instrumentation, and definitely expertise. And the overall goal is really just to encourage scientific collaboration, because of course we don't all have these things um, available to us. Um, so it's great if we can try and conduct multi-center preclinical trials to be more efficient and effective in studying the progression of cancer. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Gabe for a quick poll question, and then we're gonna open it up to questions. Thank you. Thanks, Katie and Tyler. So as Katie mentioned, we're going to ask a couple of quick poll questions before we move on to the Q&A section. Uh, so the questions this time are, are the following. So uh, the first one is, at what stage are you in your career? You can select one of the choices that you see in screen. And the next one is, which of the following imaging modalities and associated products would you like to learn more about from Synthica instrumentation? You can select all of those that apply. We're just gonna wait a couple of moments for everyone to answer, and then we're gonna move on to the Q&A.
Okay, thank you everyone for answering the poll. We will now move on to the Q&A. And the first question being, when considering multiple imaging modalities, what is the best course of action in terms of using imaging and contrast agents? Since the more, since the more modalities you use, uh, it may require the use of multiple agents. Uh, I can try to answer that one, Gabe. Um, so when it comes to designing imaging agents, uh, in the last couple decades, we've been designing actually multi-modality imaging agents to inject where on a single targeted imaging agent, if you think about an imaging agent, you're going to have kind of really uh, three distinct regions. You're going to have the targeting moiety that's going to go after the target of interest that's usually overexpressed within a cancer cell. You're going to have some kind of linker dividing region, and then you're going to have the modality that's separated from that targeting entity. But now we're able to put on multiple, multiple modalities on the single targeting entity. We can have fluorescent and PET. So we're injecting one agent to be used for multiple imaging modalities at the same time. And this is actually beneficial when it comes to injecting drugs within animal models and obviously patients because it's one drug versus multiple. Thanks, Tyler. We have a couple more questions. So um, the next one is, what if we are interested in adding optical imaging to our lab, but don't have the expertise or infrastructure to engineer our cells to express a reporter gene? Yeah, thanks, Gabe. So this is a question that um, comes up quite often, actually. Uh, so there's many groups out there that are in a position, they have a, a really relevant application that optical would work great for, but they're maybe a little bit hesitant to get started because they don't have um, their cancer cell line don't express luciferase or a fluorescent gene that would be appropriate to image. Um, and maybe they don't have the expertise or the infrastructure to engineer them themselves. Um, there is a lot of options out there um, in terms of suppliers, and it's becoming more and more uh, common. So you can actually just go online and purchase these cell lines already uh, engineered for you with whatever desired uh, reporter gene you want to use. Um, so unless you're using, you know, a very rare cancer cell line, in that case, I would try and work with a collaborator. Um, there's typically one at most facilities that are capable of engineering cell lines. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but otherwise, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different models available online. Um, so I would start there. And typically, they will already come um, fairly well characterized. So they'll give you things like, um, you know, the, the growth rates and the the, um, uh, the different reports comparing them to like the parental uh, counterpart. So that can save you quite a bit of time. Um, and really they come ready just to generate your model and start imaging. So that's a really great option for those that don't have uh, the infrastructure within their own lab to generate new cell lines. Thank you, Katie. The next question is, do you feel as though all the technology you show today needs to be included in a single study? Um, yeah, so I think it's how you start your study and how you plan it and roadmap it. No, I don't think you need to include in a single paper or definitely not in a single paper, ultrasound PET, MR, optical. It would just be overwhelming and too much. You need to be specific on what experiments you need to run. However, I do agree that maybe as you expand over time, looking at a particular drug, you might want to use those multiple instrumentations we talked about today. If we're looking at um, a drug, a cancer therapeutic drug, but it also, that particular cancer is involved in cardiac disease, you know, maybe we need to look more at the cardiac tissue and that's where ultrasound would come into play. So follow-up papers might use the multiple instruments over time, but I wouldn't say in a, maybe a single paper using all of those particular instruments. Yeah, but just to add to that, um, I just wanna make it clear. I think the point of today is really to make it um, 
apparent that there, there's just so many options out there. So rather than needing all of these, we're not suggesting that. We just, I think it's really important that, that we clearly sort of map out our research plan, as Tyler said, and really think about what we're trying to answer in our research questions. And then from there, you can start to go through the different options and better choose what technology makes the most sense for your uh, particular research group. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great answers, both of you. So we have reached the end of our session today, and I'm pretty sure we're, we're all appreciative of the extra minutes we added to our calendar today. Uh, so we're gonna wrap things up. As mentioned at the start of our webinar, we will be sure to answer um, to answer any questions in the written transcript, and we'll, we will work to get this out to you over the next few days. I would like to thank Drs. Katie Parkins and Tyler Lalonde for the wonderful presentation today. I trust that we have been able to provide you with some better understanding of the preclinical workflow needed to push an idea from bench to bedside. If in the days and weeks to come, you have further questions about the modalities discussed today, I highly encourage you to reach out to us here at Syntica, and we will be happy to discuss further. Thanks again to all of you for taking time out of your day to attend our session, and we look forward to seeing you at a future Syntica event. Have a great day, everyone.